riddled with plastic. It chokes major rivers, lakes, and beaches. It outnumbers marine life by nearly six to one. We sleep on it, we dress in it, we create with it. Plastic is in our beer, it's in our blood, it's in our breast milk. Nine years ago, I got fed up. I got fed up with being told that my consumption habits needed to change when everything was shrink-wrapped and triple-packed, with being forced to contribute to the problem every single time that I bought food or clothing. And so I decided to try and do something about it. And that required a research binge. Now, my mother was a librarian, and I know how to deep dive for information in a profoundly hedonistic way. <laughs> and here is what I learned, that the word plastic is a collective noun. There are as many types of plastics as there are sports or religions. And the plastics that we see clogging up the drains in our streets and washing up on our beaches and reaching the bellies of whales are not the scariest kinds. The plastics that we use to coat the fabric for our clothes and the pans that we cook with and the furniture that we lounge on, these unnoticed plastics are reducing our ability to have children. They are increasing cholesterol and the incidence of ulcerative colitis, and they're reducing vaccination efficacy. And these were the plastics that would keep me awake at night and would keep me researching. And finally, one night, I read about a bee that makes plastic. And in the morning, something had shifted. I was giddy from what I had learned. I was also running late for work, and it was pouring with rain. And as I ran for the bus, totally preoccupied, I tripped up some steps. And I cut my legs, and I tore my tights. And there on the ground, I was in like, full body rage until I saw from my rock bottom eye view a tiny piece of writing, a bit of graffiti someone had left there that said, be humble, Bumble. And in that moment, the rage vanished and it was replaced by a determined fire to create an entirely new type of plastic, one inspired by nature. That was the moment Humblebee was born. And you might be thinking, I didn't know honeybees made plastic. And they don't. And <laughs> nor do bumblebees. Our bee is part of the Hylaeus genus. And it is solitary. It doesn't live in a hive. It doesn't make honey. It is tiny and it's black. And it makes a plastic to line its nest to house its babies. And that nesting material, according to literature that I had just been reading, was resistant to water, which was a key property that made those specific and scary plastics so very, very useful. It was also resistant to really strong acids and pretty much any solvent that had been thrown at it. Now, I didn't know at this time what this mission would entail, uh, but I knew that as an animal-loving, tree-climbing water baby, that I was so in love with the idea of using nature and her millions of years of research and development to solve our industrial problems. So, we cracked on. And I found, to my absolute delight, that this was an entire field of science called biomimicry, literally to copy nature. Now, if I was going to copy nature, I needed some of the material, which was a whole lot harder than going down to the local hive, because solitary bees are a biological needle in a haystack. And I spent the better part of six months calling anyone who knew about these bees and trying to convince them to come on this journey with me. And eventually, I called Chris. Now, Chris lives in a tiny town in Australia called Kinkin. He'd shunned the family mining career for one in native bee pollination services. And he agreed to help me get some of the material. He set up nesting boxes in places that he thought that they would like, but he cautioned me they're fussy creatures, mate, no guarantees. <laughs> and an entire summer passes, and when he checks the nesting boxes, they're full. And now I had a decision to make. I could either pay for the tests on the material, or I could put a deposit on a house. And I did something that everyone at the time, including myself, thought was insane, and I chose the beats. Um, <laughs> And 
and a research facility in New Zealand confirmed that yes, the material was water resistant. It was also resistant to naked flames and it had a higher melting point than polyester. And these results were way better than we could have expected. The problem was that the material was so strong once it had formed, we couldn't unlink it and figure out what it was made of and we needed the precursors. We needed live bees. And bee hunts are expensive. And I had already spent my life savings and we were going to need a whole lot more money, way more money than I had access to. And at that point, I saw the market need stronger than ever. I saw Greenpeace doing a global campaign on the problem. I saw international regulation coming in. And I saw that the extent of the pollution problem had reached the Arctic. Now, we have known for centuries that nature makes some seriously superior products, but making them at scale and at a cost that we can use is a whole different ballgame. Take hydrocortisone, for example, a miraculous anti-arthritis drug discovered in the 1930s. In order to get 500 milligrams, they had to cut up 45 kg of animal tissue, animal adrenal glands, making it a very expensive and messy process. 15 years later, they had figured out how to chemically synthesize it using a 40-step process, which was still far too expensive for the general population. And now, they have genetically engineered a yeast to express the gene for hydrocortisone without cutting up any animals, without any kind of chemical synthesis. You can buy it for a couple of dollars a kilogram. The gene for hydrocortisone is one recipe. The global genome, all 8.7 billion species, is a recipe book filled with some of the most miraculous materials, most of them completely unknown, and millions going extinct every year. But every startup incubator that I talked to said it was too early, and the way that funding is set up in New Zealand, you have to be a university spin out in order to access early stage cash. So I gave up and two years passed, but I was still kind of obsessed with the idea. <laughs> and I was reading story after story that made me think that this was possible. I was reading about a guy who'd isolated a special type of collagen from a flea, and he was using it to make bionic joints that were better than our own. And about a company who was using spider proteins to make silk fabric. And my then boyfriend said to me, you are always gonna wonder if you don't try. And so I moved to Wellington, where I was introduced to one of the best creative chemists in the world. And Richard and I met for a drink, and I showed him the research that we had so far. And he was reading the document, his face becoming more and more puzzled. And when he finished, he looked up and said, this is fascinating. We have to find out how they make this stuff. <laughs> and as soon as I had Richard on board, I started getting in front of investors. And I was pitching and pitching, and bee season was well underway. I called Chris again, he's still really keen to help. And in 2016, just in time for Christmas, three bold investors came through, and I planned to go and meet Chris in February, but between Christmas and New Year's, he rings me and he says, the winter's been warm, the rains are late, everything is flowering completely out of whack, and if you don't get here soon, there won't be any bees. And we would have to wait a whole other year, and that was not an option. So I jumped on a plane, and I parked up in a caravan at the bottom of Chris and his family's garden. And we needed 30 specimens of exactly the same species in order to get a clear result. And in the first week, we got none. This was the climate crisis in action. When the winter is warm, flowers bloom early, and the bees come out to play, and then the gap between the first round of flowers drying up and the second ones blooming, that is starvation territory for bees, for all insects. Luckily, Chris is a beloved local. He fights fires in his spare time. He removes the python from the school chook house on the regular. And so the community of Kin, Kin open their gardens to us and we go and we stand by the few trees and flowers that are blooming. We go early in the morning and we go in the evening because the temperature of the nectar has to be just right for these fussy bees to forage. And we get our specimens. And now I had to keep them alive because their tissue starts to break down as soon as they're not and we needed it for our analysis. 
And so I tend to them so carefully and we only lose two, which is a miracle because they are the most high maintenance pet that you can possibly <laughs> imagine. And I take these beloved bees and I give them to my microscopic dissectionist and he pulls them apart, which was really painful, but for the greater good. Um, and we put them into little vials and we take them back to New Zealand for analysis. And my team of chemists pour over the results and they glean a set of molecules that could, when linked, create a material that had the same properties as the nesting material. And they developed a method to recreate those molecules. But as we go, we realize that the method that we would use to recreate them was going to be too expensive. And I think back to hydrocortisone, and I ask myself, where is the most efficient recipe for this material? It's in the bees. It's in the bees. And so, this year, I joined Chris and a cohort of bee wranglers, and we caught more specimens, and this time, we sequenced their genome. This is the first time this genome has ever been sequenced. And we're about to start reading it. As I give the speech, we are comparing our lab-made plastic to the naturally occurring one, and we hope that one day soon, our polymer will be used to coat, safely coat, the fabrics of your clothes and the furniture that you lounge on. <laughs> and the first results of our polymer applied to fabric are really promising. People often ask me, how did you get this idea and when did you get started? And I think back to where I first fell in love with biology. It was in the central Otago Plateau in the Tyree River. This is where I saw lambs being born. I ran my first experiments on skinks. And I observed strange critters in the silty soil of the river. This is my Tsuranga Waiwai. And I want to ask you guys a question. And I want you to let your gut respond instinctively. Does it scare you when you hear about fish and insect populations plummeting by 80% or at the disappearance of the Amazon? It scares me. And I actually think that that is a sensible response, given it is an existential threat to our species. <laughs> um, and we are losing the best resource we have at saving ourselves because nature's genome is the greatest library that has ever been created and we are losing it without having read it. It represents an opportunity for humanity to figure out ways to grow and live and create without poisoning ourselves and our home. And I feel this opportunity like a balloon of hope in my chest because I can see that it is a growing movement. I was at a tech summit recently and I heard about a company that was using a cluster of soil microbes to be applied in the mining industry that was going to save trillions of liters of fresh water. About a biological glue inspired by the secretions of a snail that was being used to save the lives of children born with holes in their hearts. Humblebee is just one company trying to replace one type of plastic. We need hundreds more companies who are willing to read Nature's Library and unlock the secrets of her incredible inventions to create new, circular, and safe materials. We need to do this. Mutato a muri muriake nei, for us and for our children after us. Kia ora.